And good morning. Good morning. My name is Shamia Fagan. I use she, her pronouns, and I am honored to serve as Oregon's 28th Secretary of State. And my mission as Oregon's Secretary of State is to build trust, to build trust between the people of Oregon and their state government so that Oregon's public services can actually make a positive difference in people's everyday lives. And serving as Oregon's chief auditor is one of my core constitutional responsibilities as Secretary of State and really a powerful tool to build trust with the people of Oregon. It is my responsibility to hold state leaders accountable when we fail to address our most urgent problems and in housing and education and drug abuse prevention, Oregonians are struggling. And the audits we have released provide valuable information that lawmakers can use to improve outcomes for Oregonians, but only if they lead to actions. And the fact is all Oregonians benefit from effective and well-managed public services. The critical work of the audits division provides state agencies with valuable insights into how to improve outcomes for Oregonians and ensures that public resources have the biggest possible impact in the lives of the families who need them the most. Today, we're here to discuss the Oregon Employment Department's Unemployment Insurance Program. Look, the goal of a safety net is to be there when you need it. That's the foundational principle of a program like unemployment insurance. All of our working lives, employees and employers pay into this insurance program through payroll taxes, because knowing the benefit is there, if we need it, helps us sleep better at night. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, the sudden and drastic increase in unemployment broke that system. Suddenly millions needed that safety net across the country. And here in Oregon, there were many, many, many people more than ever that needed it and it simply wasn't there for them. The damage to the public's trust could take a generation to repair, but rebuilding that trust begins today. This audit analyzes and explains why Oregon's unemployment insurance program failed when Oregon families needed it the most. And it identifies concrete, actionable steps that the Oregon Employment Department and the, and the Oregon legislature can take to make sure help is available the next time Oregonians need it. Looking back at 2020, this audit identifies several key factors that led to the breakdown in the system. These include outdated IT systems, a phone system that couldn't scale up to the amount needed, and the need to quickly staff up while implementing multiple new federal programs, and of course, having staff not, not needing or wanting or being able to be safely in the building because of a global pandemic. The recommendations focus on areas where the Oregon Employment Department can improve systems ahead of future surges in unemployment. I want to thank, as always, our audits director, Kip Mehmet, and our team for their hard work and professionalism. Our audit team, I'm very proud of them. They really take great care and adhere to strict standards of quality. And there's an incredible resource. Uh, they are an incredible resource and I'm very proud to work alongside them to give Oregonians the transparency and, a, and accountability that they can expect from this office. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to our audits director, Kip Mehmet, to introduce the audits team. Thank you, Secretary Fagan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kip Mehmet. I'm the audits director for the Secretary of State's office. My pronouns are he and his. I want to thank Secretary Fagan, as always, for her amazing support for the division and for her very strong comments and good summary of our report. I also want to thank all of the media here. Uh, I know you're busy and have priorities, and so we always appreciate your time and attention on the work we do. That really helps maximize the impact that we can have in state government and the use of public resources for what we do here. As the Secretary noted, this audit takes a real deep dive into the struggles Oregon experienced during uh, processing unemployment claims and providing good customer service during the pandemic. Um, it really highlights the real urgency to continue the long-standing uh, modernization effort of our employment program here in the state. Um, and before I turn it over to uh, introduce the team and turn it over to Ben to facilitate the q and I do want to note, we, put, we do take pains in the report to point this out, to place this in context as well. No states were prepared for the pandemic. 
All state unemployment insurance offices and departments struggled to get these payments out. That's not an excuse. As the secretary said, these safety nets need to be there. But I just want to note, we had full cooperation from the agency. Uh, they have made several improvements uh, during the process, and they've agreed to implement those detailed recommendations the secretary referred to. So I just want to tip my hat to them. Uh, they care about Oregonians, and they did work under very adverse circumstances to the best that they could. But we do need to improve it, and this report is a, is a map to go forward with that. I'm I'm going to close by just introducing our strong and great audit team. Ian Green was the manager, Steve Wynn uh, led the project, and uh, Christina Nichols uh, was the staff auditor. And having said that, Ben, I'll turn it over to you to uh, get into the Q&A. Thanks, Kip. Appreciate that. Uh, so for questions, uh, if, you, if folks could just use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, uh, we'll go in the order that I see folks uh, popping up. Uh, raise your hand is under the reactions button if you haven't used Zoom recently. Um, so go ahead and, and raise your hand and we'll jump right in. Okay, uh, first question I'm seeing is from Rob at OPV. Rob, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for doing this and thanks for taking my question. Um, I wonder how much of uh, what the auditors found uh, could have been avoided if recommendations had been followed from previous Secretary of State audits of the Employment Department? You know, I can take the first stab at that. Um, I, you know, to answer short in brief, I think it would have helped a lot. Um, I think we were right on point with those reports. We've highlighted those in the audit. Um, again, in context, there were other there were other barriers and challenges and priorities that could have been there. But just to be brief with you, Rob, great question is, yeah, I mean, that's why we proffered these recommendations at the time. Often these recommendations are developed collaboratively, in fact, most frequently with the agency, so they generally agree with it. So yeah, without a doubt, we believe that, it, but like all of our audits, if, if they're actioned, uh, it could prevent further risk down the road. Just to follow up, do you have sort of a most obvious example of something that they could have done maybe without too much cost or, or difficulty that they did not do? So Rob, Ian Green, audit manager, uh, one of the challenges that the employment department faced when implementing these new federal programs was making sure there was appropriate notices going out. And given the old mainframe system they were operating on, they couldn't customize the system needs to meet the, the pandemic related programs. So if they would have adopted a modern system several years ago, it's likely that would have more flexibility to recode that system to enable the, those programs to be operated efficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the next hand I saw was Mike from the Oregonian. Mike, go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Um, the audit documents pretty thoroughly the, the lack of processes and procedures for handling adjudication. Do you have a sense of why those processes weren't in place? Thanks for your question, Mike. Uh, Steve, I, I may ask you to fill in some additional details, but I think one of the challenges was during the pandemic, they needed to really ramp up the adjudication program. At the same time, the state's rules had changed around the eligibility for the program, as well as some of the standards around availability, what the discharges were from their prior employment. All of those required changes to the existing protocols and processes. So I think they were really just kind of uh, adjusting to the rapid changes, and they didn't well document it during that process. And Steve, any additional thoughts you have? Uh, no, I think you, I think you got it there. I'm, I'm Steve, but I'm, I'm totally on this. No, I think, um, I think you pretty much covered it there. Good. And, and just to follow up real quick, you know, maybe asking you to expand a little on that. I, I'm wondering how much, if you were to assign the, the, the responsibility for the adjudication issues. How much of you would you say is a, a technological limitation because of the IT systems? How much of it was administrative and, and how much of it was, was cultural uh, resistance to change to the, to the department? If I was to assign you know, the challenges with the adjudication, I think it's really largely training new staff to perform that work and then the administrative changes that related from the pandemic and keeping up to date with those. Because there were many rapid changes from you know, March of 2020 through the summer around these programs. Great, thank you. 
Uh, the next hand I saw was from uh, C.H. Giardinelli. Uh, sorry, I don't have your full name, but uh, go ahead. It's Christina um, with K2. Thanks for taking questions. Uh, just wondering in the introduction, it kind of breaks down a little bit that adjudication process could have some biases when it comes to race and ethnicity. It doesn't really dive into that much. Just wondering what you know, what you guys saw there and then what the agency is doing to address that. Yeah, so one of the challenges with the mainframe system that the agency has is that some of its data um, is not as complete of a picture as it could be around the demographics of people claiming unemployment insurance. So one of the things OED is going to do going forward in their system modernization is really focus their efforts around collecting that information so they can further analyze it. Um, we weren't able to identify any particular cause for why certain races and certain income levels had longer adjudications, but it was a concerning trend to us that we felt that OED should be monitoring this going forward. Prior to the pandemic, those demographic groups didn't have any significant difference among themselves in, in terms of longer delays. But during the pandemic, some groups had to wait an additional two weeks, which is quite a significant amount of time when you consider that the adjudication process is already, already a weeks to month long process. So additional two weeks beyond that, it, it's just really hard of a burden for those claimants to bear. What race and ethnicity in there oh, very quickly? I just wanted to make sure that I like to give credit where credit is due. And I want to just acknowledge Senator Casey Jama in a briefing that we were doing with legislators talking about that we were going to do this audit. It was Senator Jama who had heard stories from folks in community uh, who had been refugees or had language barriers. He had heard anecdotal stories about it taking longer. And so that's how that made it up into our auditors listening to Senator Jama who had listened to or to people of Oregon and to folks in the community. And it turns out as Ian just noted, the evidence did bear out that there was a disproportionate um, effect on certain communities, but I just want to give Senator Casey Jama credit for him actually listening to the community and bringing that to our auditor's attention and then credit to our auditors for for following through on that recommendation from Senator Jama. Uh, thank you. That kind of answered my my follow up question there on what uh, races, ethnicity, ethnicity, sorry, we are uh, talking about here. Uh, just wondering, is there a follow up audit to this to see if it's still happening uh, on that specific front? So we perform follow-ups to all of our audits. Um, they usually occur about a year after we complete our audit. So I would anticipate some follow-up on this report. Thanks. Uh, the next hand I saw was Bill from the Statesman Journal. Bill, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much. Um, so one of the things I noticed in the audit is the ombudsman office, um, and that's something that it looks like other states have been doing. I didn't really know much about that. Um, as far as the recommendation of, of would it be to create a specific ombudsman, I can't pronounce it correctly, um, for this, for, for the employment department and how, how would that be able, you know, with, with what we had and we had so many like state senators and state representatives during the early parts of pandemic who were trying to help out and even U.S. senators and all that basically acting as what, what it sounds like uh, what an ombudsman would be in this situation. Um, what, what kind of, um, would that be, a, do you, are you guys really recommending a, se a separate office for that that's separate from the employment department or how would that work in your recommendation? So within uh, existing programs here in state government, we've got a variety of ombuds offices. Uh, one of them is in the long-term care program at the Department of Human Services, and that really advocates for people in long-term care facilities. There's also several other ones that advocate for different health and human service programs off the office or the Oregon Health Authority and the Oregon Department of Human Services. Uh, we even have an ombuds office here in the Secretary of State's office, the Office of Small Business Assistance, that provides uh, assistance to individuals that need it when dealing with government bureaucracy and complex rules and requirements of various programs. So there's a variety of opportunities for the state to implement an ombuds office or program within the employment department, uh, similar to the other programs that already exist. Um, several other states have explored this as well that we call out in the report. Thanks, Ian. 
Uh, not seeing any additional hands, I'd like to just open it up for anyone who may have follow-up questions or additional questions for the team. Go ahead. Uh, I, sorry, I saw a few hands, so I'm not sure if it's me or someone else. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. We'll get to Rob. Um, thanks. Yeah, just wondering, I didn't see much in terms of staffing determinations. Was there anything looked at in terms of what the agency should have or should do in the future with staffing? I know that some of the staff that they had hired um, are no longer there because they were contracted for that period of time. Is there a plan in place to look at short-term contracts that way? So we have some detail in the report around staffing. And one of the challenges that the employment department really faced is going into the pandemic, we had really low unemployment rates across the nation. And the funding that is provided to unemployment insurance programs is tied in part to those rates. So when rates are low, they receive less funding, they have less staffing. When rates go up, they receive more staffing and funding to provide the services they need to. Uh, I think there are some opportunities for them to develop some short-term contracts that are at the ready. I know other departments like the Oregon Department of Transportation has that for various programs when they need to scale up. Um, so there's certainly some opportunities there, but part of it's just inherent of going into a recession or a pandemic when unemployment are, rates are low and then they scale up to high. It, it takes some time for those programs to get the staff when they need. And then it takes several weeks to train the staffing, even if you hire them. Uh, I think it's an eight to 12 week program of intensive training to understand all the complexities of the system. And just a quick follow up to that, you know, with the situation that we are in right now with inflation and staffing, is this being looked at as a potential issue, you know, if we run into a recession and if we run into increased unemployment rates, uh, what are we going to do about staffing with 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 that issue? So that wasn't in the scope of our audit work, but I would certainly encourage you to reach out to the employment department. I'm, I'm sure that's an issue that they're aware of and is on their radar. Thanks. Let's uh, let's jump over to Rob. Rob, you have a follow up. Yeah, my question is sort of an overall broad question for the secretary. Just as you look at the audit and the circumstances that faced uh, the employment department, how much of this was an agency like agencies across the country that were facing an unprecedented demand for uh, unemployment insurance money benefits? Uh, versus how much of it was a, a problem that was made worse by, you know, just OED's uh, lack of preparation and, and other internal problems. Thanks for the question, Rob. I mean, first off, we made sure, and every time we talk about this audit, we talk about centering on the fact that real people's lives were impacted. This is not just numbers and data and IT. This is parents stressing about not being able to pay their mortgages or their rent. This is people literally not being able to put gas in their cars to go you know, look for work or go take a child to the doctor. This was a deeply, deeply painful experience for real people and real families in Oregon. And so we wanted to make sure first off to center the audit on that. Um, then we, of course, step to, okay, this was real pain, so we have to make sure it doesn't happen again, right? We have to make sure that we provide these tools and these recommendations to both lawmakers and the agency to say, you know, I'll be damned if Oregonians will, Oregonians will ever experience this kind of pain again when a program that they have paid into their entire working lives doesn't work at the time when they need it the most. And so that was where we centered that. And then in terms of where that you know, responsibility lies. Was it, yeah, sure, nobody was prepared for a pandemic. In fact, I thought the auditors did a great job just visually of the graph. I forget which page it was on. Ian, you could point them to it, but where it showed kind of the standard amount of unemployment claims. And then it just shot up like to the top of the page on that one page, just showing this was, of course, an unprecedented amount of claims, which, of course, other states faced as well. 
And so, you know, but other states in some other states, I mean, I have friends in New York who were on the phone, you know, over and over again. So other states obviously had a difficult time as well. But one thing Oregon did better than other states, or at least did relatively well in comparison, was a lower rate of fraud, right? And but there's a trade-off, right? The more fraud protections you have, the the slower the the